natural reservoirs of carbon are enormous compared to what the anthropogenic emissions are. And if you talk about gigatons of carbon in the terrestrial biosphere, that's trees and whatnot, 710 gigatons. In the oceans, uh, um, around 760 gigatons of carbon. And that is sort of what's called clim climatically available carbon. That means there's you know, limestone rocks and things that are not available to get used in climate change. So anyway, that's on a time scale of around session. So the point is you have uh, 1,400 kilos, or sorry, 1,400, 1400 gigatons. A gigaton, by the way, is 10 to 15 grams um, available. And uh, in the oceans, there's an uptake, a turnover of around 100 gigatons per year. And in the atmosphere, there is an uptake of around 120 gigatons per year. So around 16% of all the CO2 in the atmosphere is cycled through the surface ecosystems every year. So nature has got this massive carbon exchange going on. And it, it is essential, I think, to think about that uh, when you're considering anthropogenic emissions, which admittedly are large. But, um, oh, and there's one other thing that you have to keep in mind. These massive uh, photo, uh, uh, photosynthetic uptakes and whatnot uh, are uh, balanced by, um, there's a, a photosynthesis and there's respiration. So there, there, there's uptake and then there's emission of the CO2, uh, the greenhouse gases. And, and these are almost balanced. And at the present time, the uh, uh, net flux, so-called, is not really known very well at all. If you look at uh, all the numbers that the uh, uh, UN FCCC process, the, the, the UN uh, uh, climate change folks who were uh, failed yet again in Copenhagen uh, to, to get to an agreement, uh, these, the, they're working with numbers that are just very poor. And, and we need to know those numbers better. Could you give me a rough idea of how much of our, I mean, when the Earth was first formed four billion years ago, it was supposed to be, all the atmosphere was supposed to be carbon, and then the, the, the primordial, uh, you know, this blue bacteria and everything, took the carbon dioxide and converted it to oxygen and stored the carbon. And I just wanted, do you have a rough figure? Is, it, is, it, is a rough figure available? Of how much of the original carbon dioxide that was in the atmosphere was taken up as fossil fuels, which we were burning. And how much of it went to other things like limestone, or carbon costs? Well, there's a, oh, I mean, we could talk about this for hours. Um, first of all, most of the carbon in the atmosphere, most of the carbon, um, you know, um, certainly most of the carbon in the atmosphere, uh, in, the, in the mantle, came, was, was, um, came from a, a meteorite, carbonaceous meteorite. The, uh, Yes, the, the four billion uh, whatever year, uh, uh, Earth's lifetime, is the time at which ma uh, large collisions with other celestial bodies decrease. Okay? So before that, the Earth existed uh, as it was uh, uh, um, accumulating dust and so on and growing and becoming a planet. Um, but during a very long period of time, there were so many collisions with other planetoids and whatnot um, that each time there was a collision, the temperature rose so high that all of the water would be lost and all of the volatiles that presently were at the time on the Earth would be lost. And so then they, they would begin to accumulate again. So, you know, it, it, I, it would take a long time to through the whole story, but the bottom line is that um, um, the carbon on the Earth was mostly from those kinds of, of smaller collisions that were just of, of carbonaceous meteorites. Uh, water, by the way, mostly from uh, comets. And uh, and so what we have is what was brought to us by those by those. 
Hmm. Wow. Well, maybe other stories about that. But anyway, bottom line is we don't know what the natural ecosystems are doing, and it would be good to know by comparison with the six or seven gigatons of uh, contribution that um, people are doing. So the idea was that um, uh, we're going to quantify this with uh, MIOS. We're going to measure tropospheric greenhouse gases. Um, we're going to uh, determine, we're also going to measure air pollution, air pollutants. And this is what we're going to, so this is our equivalent of the Schiamacchi laundry list of molecules. It's, ours is somewhat shorter, but nevertheless, um, we're going to measure, <coughs> retrieve these species in the troposphere. Uh, our native resolution is 5 by 10 kilometer pixels, so it's 5 kilometers wide and 10 kilometers high in the direction of travel in the vehicle. And uh, it's an array detector, so we have all these uh, pixels uh, for a total of 160 kilometers swath. That's for the greenhouse gases. Air quality gases, so-called the pollutants, um, have stronger signals, so we can have a 5 by 2 kilometer resolution and more of them for uh, 180 kilometers swath. Um, because all the instruments are on the same vehicle, and they're all foresighted together, so you're retrieving all of these things from the same air parcel at the same time. And you can therefore do a lot of chemistry with that. Um, then the cloud imaging, and uh, the CMOS, I mentioned there's a CMOS imager. We can measure surface resolution the same as Landsat, right? I mean, you've got a bright signal, so we have 30, 30 uh, meter resolution for, for that. And uh, the main thing that I will say about the NEOS uh, proposal, which is different from any other previous proposal, is that all of the measurements that we are retrieving are assimilated immediately in real time, and real time means how soon can you get it down from the satellite, into uh, models. They're as atmospheric model, geos for those of you who know about atmospheric model, it's a global atmospheric model. And uh, the surface ecosystem models, and very likely you've never heard of these, but these are um, used extensively by people uh, in Natural Resources Canada and, and, and forestry and so on. So um, this this is this is unique, and uh, and here's the reason. Uh, you you run an atmospheric model on the domain, so this is the domain that we're interested in, and this is what we're looking at. The satellite makes an overpass, and it measures, uh, that's 160 kilometers wide, and it measures the atmosphere under that overpass. And so you know very well what's in the atmosphere there. The model is inaccurate, it's, you know, it's, it's good, but it's not really good. And so the satellite can take that measurement and give it to the model, and so at that point it corrects the model. So the model then is correct at, under that swan. But not only that, because the model has physics and chemistry built into it, the model can propagate that information out a little bit, a little bit, and lots of things. But it's it's uh, it increases the width. So then, um, as the more and more uh, overpasses occur, uh, this assimilation process, if you give it to the model um, each time you overpass, then you begin to fill in blanks, and then on the next um, day, uh, you get some more uh, or, uh, um, measurements, and all of these, all of this information is fed into the model, and the model, what can I say, remembers it, right? It's corrected at, at, those, at those places. And so after a while, you have accumulated enough information, uh, enough measurements, so that um, the model description now in this I'm talking about a few days or weeks or something, it's not long. The model description is going to be pretty much as, as good as you can measure. So now, you don't need to go to the website and get the satellite measurement anymore. You just go and look at the model output, which is very convenient because the model output, of course, is all nicely gridded for you and, and 